You're listening to an archived Cabral Concept podcast. After listening to this show, check out the most up-to-date podcasts available at stephencabral.com slash podcasts or search directly on iTunes. And now, welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurvedic healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. Excited you could join me here today. I really have been waiting so long to bring you the show on the Ayurvedic diet and the exact dosha diets based on your unique body type of where you are today and also what imbalances you may have that need to be remedied. So the reason why this is such an important show is we've been going over Ayurvedic medicine each week, one podcast per week for the past three to four weeks, and I will continue each week to bring you one new Ayurvedic medicine-based show. Why is this so important? The reason is this, is that after today's show, I do hope that you understand that there is not one diet for every individual. So we start talking about high carb or low carb, high fat or low fat, higher protein or lower protein. You can make an argument for all of those different diets for a specific individual and also for a very specific time in their life. You do have to understand that in Ayurvedic medicine, there's actually two constitutions or two body types for each individual, meaning that it's their genotype of how they were born. This is your genetic state. This is actually your balanced body type that you always have to work within that framework of. That's called your prakriti. It's very, very important to understand that because a lot of people are misdiagnosing their body type today. They're misdiagnosing their dosha because I work with so many individuals, so do my team, and they believe they're one thing and they're correct. So they believe that they're a specific dosha. A lot of people believe they're the vata dosha, and I'll explain why in just a moment. They believe they're the vata because it's their current state, and that's called your vakriti. So you do have to understand that's not your genotype. That's not your prakriti. That's not who you are. It's the current state that you're in, and that's called your vakriti. In Ayurveda, that is actually an imbalance. So if your vrakriti is not a bound state of your prakriti, which is your genotype, that means something's off. And that means that you are now more susceptible to a dis-ease state in your body. And that is when the kapha body type gets the high blood pressure or they start to become overweight or obese. Because so many people out there are confused when I tell them their predominant body type is kapha, they're offended. They say, I'm not overweight though. You should have seen me as a teenager, et cetera, et cetera. And I say, listen, the important thing that we're speaking about today is there's no one best body type. And the kapha body type is not overweight. No one said the kapha body type is overweight. The kapha body type should not be overweight, right? They should not start to get more weight around the middle or around the hips. It is the frame of the body. We're talking about physical constitution. I'll explain that in a moment as well. So the kapha body type, hopefully you tuned in last week where I showed you photos of all different body types and actually what that body type looks like in when they're in their best shape. Sometimes maybe a little too lean for the body type, and I did explain why on last week's podcast. That was episode 922. I do hope you tune into that where I gave you all the different celebrity and athlete, basically, body types. And I showed how they're all in amazing shape, no matter what body type you are. But a lot of people, they say, you should have seen me as a teenager. First of all, most people's bodies have not reached maturation when they're a teenager. However, a good Ayurvedic practitioner or Ayurvedic doctor already knows a person's constitution as a child, teenager, or whatever it might be, and they'll know what that will be as an adult, and then they'll know what that child or teenager, whoever it might be, will have to watch out for in the future. Now, what is the reason why so many people believe that they are a vata? The reason why they believe they're a vata is because mentally, okay, remember, it's the mentally, they feel like they're in a vata state, and they are absolutely correct. And the problem is we have a lot of people teaching online right now Ayurvedic medicine improperly. They're teaching it from a psychological standpoint and then using diet 
to help pacify that mental state. And although I appreciate them teaching Ayurvedic medicine, it's incorrect when you balance the mental state with diet specifically. And the reason is that you will very quickly imbalance a kapha body type when you give them a vata-based diet, which I'm going to go over today. Okay. So quick recap, vata would be more of the thinner frame, meaning very small wrists and ankles and kind of longer face. I can't go through all of that today. So if you haven't tuned into the podcast, you you do have to go through those. And the reason is that Ayurvedic medicine is very in-depth. And so for me to do it justice with a cursory overview would be would be unethical, in my opinion. It wouldn't be the proper thing to do. So just keep in mind that under a lot of stress, any body type can lose weight very, very quickly. And then also quite imbalanced, any body type can gain weight quickly as well. And that goes for the vata as well. So the problem is that when we are in a mental vata-based state, which why do we all feel kind of that way? Well, we live a lot of times in this Western-based society. And when you live in a Western-based world, it's go, go, go. It's, you know, get the kids ready for school. It's get out the door, fight traffic, deadlines, all those things. That's vata mixed with a secondary of pitta, right? But there's no kapha in there. Kapha would be more of the relaxation-based state, the taking it easier state, the moving slower state. We don't live in that slow-paced world, right? The best version I saw of that was when I was in the Greek islands. And I actually have quite a, a few friends that are Greek, and they were born in Greece, and they came over. Many of them went back to Greece because they liked that pace of life to a better degree. Now, obviously, is am I just generalizing? Of course. In Greece, you'll find the cities, and again, I haven't been to a lot of the mainland-based cities. I'm talking more of island life in general. That means like when a lot of people go to uh, certain islands, there's that island pace, right? That would be more of the kapha-based pace. And the frenetic pace would be like more like New York City or, I oh, will pick any big city, right? It doesn't have to just be New York. So you can find that in any place in life. And that's why a lot of us, when we think about vacation, we think about going to an island and just kind of taking it easy because that's that kapha-based pace. Or if you're someone like me from Boston and you just go to the south, the south of the United States, you don't even need to go to an island. The pace is a little slower in the south. Now, obviously, that's a generalization. If you go to Miami, the pace is certainly just as fast as Boston, I would say, maybe a little slower. But again, if I were in Boston, if I were to go to New York, the pace is even faster than Boston. So there's obviously always varying degrees. So the vata, though, would burn out faster in New York and would be much more nourished and able to heal if it were to go to some island such as, let's just say, the Bahamas, right? Or they would go to one of the Greek islands. One of my favorite is Mykonos or Santorini, and that would be a great place to relax. Now, they don't have to go to an island. What could a vata body type do? They could simply go into the woods and go for a three-day camp or a seven-day camping trip. They get out in nature, slower pace, they're near running water. All of those things would be very, very beneficial. So why am I telling you all that today? It's the reason is so many people are misdiagnosing their dosha. And part of it is they simply don't want to accept their natural body type. And I can understand that because certain body types in our Western-based world are more prized than others. And so for me too, as a male, and I gave you my predominant dosha back on episode 922, and you can see the different body types, like my body type, how it could morph, right? It could morph into more of the pitta, it can morph into more of the kapha. But at the end of the day, my balanced state is still more of that vata body state, right? The vata body type or dosha. And I have a strong secondary dosha of kapha, and then a tertiary of of the pitta. But the problem is, for the longest time, I believed I was the pitta body type. And the reason I did that is because my mind is 99.9999% pitta. So if I go by my mental state, I believe that I'm pitta, right? Because of all of the different factors that led me to this pitta mindset. One is that it's, you know, it's part of who I am. It's being the oldest born. It is that the, the fiery, if you want to call it, the Aries-based astrological sign. It's all of those things, right? It's how I grew up. It's all of that, right? Led to this mindset of mine. And I don't mind that. I think it's great. And now, how do I balance that mindset? I can't balance it with diet because you're going to see today. If I balance my Pitta mindset with the cooling of Kapha, I end up building up a lot of mucus. 
and I actually get worse. I get more allergies and I get more sluggishness. So you have to understand that you don't balance your mindset with diet alone. You can use some diet, but what happens is, if especially if it's out of season, you imbalance your actual genotype. And for me, I have a strong kapha predominance, which means in the winter time, or if I just start to gain weight, if my body tips, you know, it's that rain barrel effect. If I get, if I start to put on weight because I'm trying to put on muscle, whatever it might be, I can take it too far, and then all of a sudden I start to add quite a bit of body fat as well, even though I'm predominantly vata. That's why you have to understand. It's your prakriti, your genotype, and then what you do with that is your vakriti, right? It's your phenotype, what you become. So for me, when we talk about the psychology of Ayurveda, what we need to think about is balancing that through lifestyle as well. And I'm going to be teaching more of this. Each week, I'm going to be going more into Ayurveda. So all of the people teaching right now, looking at your mindset, your mindset as part of your prakriti, I understand it. But the problem is then they're teaching to balance it through diet and you can't do that, right? You can't do that alone. It has to be through the lifestyle because it's a lifestyle that also led to that mindset. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new quiz style or whatever it might be. I'm going to break it down through your actual frame, which is the important part for the diet. Then I'm going to break it down for your psychology, which is obviously a lot of that as your psychology and lifestyle. And then I'll break it down to one more part, which is your physiology, which is how balanced your body is now with your natural or your genotype. So all of that is coming. Just stay tuned. Each and every week, I'll bring you one more podcast on Ayurveda. If you want to play them back, listen to them a second time, you'll get more of a feel each time you start to go through it. But today now, we're concentrating on the diet. The diet is one of the absolute most important things to keep your dosha balanced. And it's the thing that we focused on most in this Western-based mentality. We always focus on diet, right? Again, high carb, low carb, high fat, low protein, high protein. It's like, which one do I choose? And the, the problem is that a lot of the gurus out there are preaching one diet for everyone. You know, right now it's keto for everyone. And if you haven't started to see the correlations, again, a lot of health practitioners who are ahead of the game and they've been around for a couple decades, like that's the problem. And again, like it's no, yeah, obviously, if you're 23 years old and you're a health practitioner, uh, it's an amazing place to be. I obviously remember when I was 23 and a health practitioner, but you don't have the benefit of experience of seeing what happened 15 years or so before that. I don't have 20 years quite yet to say that, but if you don't have at least 15 years, then you can't see the cycles. So what's going on with keto right now is I can see that as I can see that it's simply turning back into the Atkins diet of old, right? The Atkins diet in the late 90s and early 2000s is really what keto is turning into. Because keto, which is essentially supposed to be a high fat diet, is actually morphing into a high protein diet. That's not what keto is. It's being done incorrectly. And now they're just getting back to higher fats. Now, a lot of times this time, they are talking a little bit more about avocado and maybe some healthier fats. But nonetheless, it is morphing back into the Atkins diet, which is not providing you with healthy fats. It's providing you with a lot of high omega-6 fats. Very simple test. You can simply do an omega-3 test. Really, really important. And if you are thinking about doing a keto-based diet or you're on a keto diet, if you're not running your cholesterol levels, your triglyceride levels, your liver levels, as well as your APOE genotype, you're really doing your body a disservice because you don't know if it's working for you or causing more harm then good. All right. That's my probably once a week rant on keto for everyone, but let's move on to the different diets. All right. So here's the amazing thing about diets in Ayurveda. There is no system of medicine. I'm going to repeat that. There's no system of medicine, nor will there ever be, that's more in depth about diet for the individual dosha. Like it goes beyond anything you could possibly imagine. And why do I say that? Well, diet in Ayurveda doesn't just have to do with which foods to eat for what body type. I mean, there are stages of digestion, meaning we talk about the beginning stage of how kapha is the first stage, essentially in the first part of the stomach, which is the the fundus or the initial part of digestion. And then as it moves into the gastric part of uh, the stomach and into the small intestine, we're talking about the pitta stage. And then as we get into the intestines and especially the large intestine, we're talking about more of the vata stage, but it even breaks it down from that. There are literally each hour, there's different phases of the 
dosha is taking place. So, I mean, this gets really, really in depth. And those people who want to study Ayurvedic medicine in depth, of course, can study this. And I've given you the books before to study, and I'll be teaching about this much more in depth. And if there's a need or there's a call for it, of course, I'll be happy to teach a course on Ayurvedic medicine in the future. But right now, the course is this. Each and every week on the Cabral Concept, we're going to be going into Ayurvedic medicine and the different um, levels of it. And this week, we start with diet. Next week, we'll be talking about exercise for the Ayurvedic body types and doshas as well. So let's get into it and how unique and all this is. And that's because the vata body type, you have to understand, the vata body type, when you think about it, and that's why you have to know your dosha. So go back to the previous three podcasts, which are episodes 907, 914, and 922. That will teach you your body type, and then you'll be able to get the most out of the dosha. But even still, listen to today's podcast. And that's because based on if you're a health practitioner or in your family, you have to know which child is going to do best for or parents or you know extended family, whatever it might be. I want you to be the health coach, right? I want you to be, whether you ever decide to get certified or not, the person who helps out those around you. So the Vata body type is made out of air and ether, ether being space, right? So we have to think that they need foods that ground them. So you, all, you have to think about Ayurvedic medicine as always trying to achieve balance. Same with traditional Chinese medicine, same with Taoist-based medicine. So here's the thing. The reason why conventional medicine doesn't work is because they're not trying to achieve balance. What they're trying to achieve is masking any of the symptoms that are taking place, but they're not looking at why the symptom took place in the first place. So if someone has joint pain or they have a skin rash or they have an autoimmune-based issue or anything, they're not asking, how do I balance this? They're asking, how do I knock it down? How do I mask it? Or how do I remove it from the body? And the problem with that is that you never fixed the imbalance in the first place. So if you don't fix the imbalance, you can never hope to help that person in the future. Other things are going to go wrong. So if someone has high cholesterol and you simply knock down the cholesterol with a statin, you're basically saying, okay, well, I'm going to forget about all of the other factors that led to the inflammation, the hardening of the arteries, whatever it might be. And the person's still going to die then from an earlier death. And this is the truth. And I, I, it's not meant to necessarily scare you, but it is meant to awaken us. Because the truth is this, that people who have high cholesterol often have type 2 diabetes, or they have high blood pressure, or they have any number of inflammatory-based issues because they neglected a certain imbalance in their body. So that's what we're talking about. The vata body type needs foods that are going to weigh them down, right? That are going to basically be kapha-inducing. Now, if we move over to kapha, their bodies are made up of earth and water. So they're going to need foods that are a little bit more light, that are not going to have them weigh, be as weighed down or as damp, or they call it as oily. So we like things that are maybe a little bit more drying, which is the exact opposite of the vata, which is more drying, right? So they need things that are a little bit more oily. So you have to switch the two. Now, if we look at the pitta, they're made up of predominantly fire with a secondary of water, okay? We don't have to be as careful of water, damp-based foods, but we do of heating-based foods for the pitta. This is more pronounced in a hot climate. So if you are someone that lives in, let's just say, the south of the United States, let's take Atlanta, Georgia, and we eat foods that are very high in pitta, and you're a pitta body type, you're going to be most aggravated during the summertime. You're going to be eating foods that are going to make you more hot, they're going to make you more irritable, potentially lead to more skin-based issues, rashes, all of the things that can come on that pitta body type. So what we're always talking about is balance. And believe it or not, if you live in a climate that is not balanced, these things need to switch seasonally. And I'll be talking about that more in the future as well. Today, we're just going to talk about the balance because there's so much to talk about. But just as an example for what to look forward to, for myself personally, Although my predominant body type is not kapha, I do lean that way, especially during the winter time in Boston, which the winter time in Boston basically lasts from December, you know, the end of November, all the way through April. So that's five months to potentially a little bit longer of the year of the colder, damper environment. And my body will begin to build up more mucus. And one of the reasons is, is because when I was younger, they basically 
just cut out my adenoids, cut out my tonsils, put me on thousands of capsules of amoxicillin. And so it damaged a lot of those things that would naturally help me with sinus-based issues. And since I was on so much antibiotics and they you know, basically changed the microflora of my nasal passages and they took out my filtration system behind my nasal passages, which were my adenoids, and they took out those things in the back of my throat called tonsils, which are actually just basically giant lymph to help with the immune-based system. Those are things that I have to watch out for. So what do I do? Well, of course, I watch out for them. And I eat more of the foods, even though I'm a vata, of drying, right, that aren't going to cause as much mucus. And then heating, which are going to calm all that cold of the kapha. And then I will do things such as the neti pot. So keep in mind, you can always keep your body balanced and always keep your body healthy, even if it leans in one direction, if you know what to look for. Okay, so let's get right into it today. Really important now that we understand that there are also certain tastes that go along with balancing the body type. So all of the things that are sweet and salty, sweet and salty, are going to help balance vata. Why? They are anabolic. They're anabolic. And vata is a catabolic body type. That's why they lose weight without trying. So again, if you just don't exercise, think about this. If you don't exercise and you eat whatever you want, do you lose weight or gain weight? If you lose weight, well, at least vakriti-wise, and potentially prakriti, which is your natural genotype, you will lose weight, right? You'll lose weight. And if you don't exercise and you eat basically whatever you want, if you gain weight, well, you're going to tend more towards the kapha body type. Now, the pitch is in the middle, but they can lean one way or the other. So it's very interesting. If I don't exercise, then I will certainly lose quite a bit of muscle. And for me, if I exercise, then I put on quite a bit of muscle because I have that secondary body type quite balanced with kapha and pitta. They make up a good amount of the secondary body type of mine. So, But you have to understand that I still lean more towards that because if I didn't lift the weights, if I didn't do those things, I would lose weight easily. So what do I need or what do a lot of other people need that are more that tend more towards the vata? Well, they need foods that are more sweet and salty. Well, what are those foods? Well, we'll talk about those in a minute, but there are going to be more carbohydrates and more starchier carbs and more warming foods, okay? So now for sour, sour foods, those are more metabolic food. They're more transformational, okay? Think more like of the fermented foods, which actually go a couple different ways, which I'll talk about those uh, next as well. They're going to increase pitta and digestion. They'll oftentimes well, we'll talk about that in just one moment because I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. And the pungent, the bitter, and the astringent foods are more catabolic. And the catabolic foods are going to decrease kapha. And uh, sorry, they're going to decrease, yes, kapha, and they will be better for the weight loss. And so we use them for kapha, and we use them for the mucus production, and we use them for any of the anabolism, right? Because they're more catabolic. That's the best way to say it. Okay. So, that's the first part of what we want to go over, the different types of foods. And now what we want to talk about is the different examples of those, and then I'm going to go into give you the full list of each. Okay, so examples of this. Think about this. What are vata-based foods? They're going to be the air and ether. So let me go over those now. So think about this. These foods are not going to be great if you're someone that is already too lean, they've lost too much weight, they're more catabolic, they're breaking down a little faster. Uh, they have those diseases of the body of vata, okay? So we'll go over those right now. These are the foods that you wouldn't want if you're a vata, but you would want, right? You would want if you're more of a kapha body type. Okay, let's go over those. Raw vegetables, more kapha, less vata, okay? Rough vegetables such as the cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, cabbages, sprouts, and nightshades are not as great for that vata type. Leads to sometimes more of the joint-based issues. Potatoes, tomatoes, and eggplant certainly affects me much, much more. What other foods might you not want if you're a vata body type, but more if you are a kapha body type? Beans, such as black beans, pinto beans, or chickpeas. Why? Beans have more air. more They can cause more gas, especially in the vata body type, which has a weaker digestion, a slower digestion. Now, why do they have the slower digestion? Because they move at a faster anabolic nervous system rate, which means their sympathetic nervous system is typically on overdrive 
and they actually need more calming foods and more calming lifestyle to help improve that diet, to improve that digestion. Okay, what other foods are not as great for vata? Sprouts, vegetable juices, algae, spirulina, and other things such as alcohol or tobacco. And I won't go over all the different drugs because we don't, we don't need to go over that of how they can affect them. Now, why? Well, anything that is stimulating in nature or a little bit lighter. So the stimulating would be alcohol. Alcohol basically can act as a stimulant and then a depressant. Initially stimulant and then eventually depressant in the body and leave you more hypoglycemic, which Vata body types have to deal with a lot of times with hypoglycemia because their body's constantly burning through their glucose which is why they actually do better with carbs and they, a keto-based diet and low-carb diet is detrimental to that body type. But again, you won't hear the keto people out there because they say all for one and they just pull on specific studies. Now, keto, we'll talk about in a minute, would be not the best choice for kapha, but it would be, makes more sense for them, but certainly not in the long run. Okay. So understand that, but it doesn't mean vegetable juices are bad for vata. That's why Ayurvedic medicine is so complex. If you're choosing vegetable juices, juices, you're not choosing the leaves for vata. You're choosing more of what? The celery juice, more of the carrot juice, more of the beet. Why? Because those are root vegetables and they're great for the vata. So these are just general overviews. So when I say this, it doesn't mean all of a sudden stop your vegetable juices. No, it means balance. You might have a vegetable juice before then some type of meal, which is more hearty, right? Okay. So always understand there's balance, but I'm trying to give you the overview of the bulk of what you should be looking at. All right, so now, what are the foods that are great for heating up the kapha, the colder part of the kapha, but not good for the pitta? Spices, especially heating spices such as hot peppers, black pepper, cinnamon, cloves, ginger, garlic, and onions. Not great for the pitta, the ones that are producing more heat but great, like really great for that kapha body type. And for me, you've heard me talk about it all last season on the Cabral Concept. One of the things that I've like really grown affectionate for is hot sauces during the winter. I love them. I have like eight hot sauces in my refrigerator in my office at work since they're already acidic based that I just keep them in the drawer at my drawer at work. And when I'm eating lunch out, Whatever the lunch is, I can turn it into a pitta-based meal or an anti kapha meal just by adding hot sauce. See, that's the balance in Ayurveda when you know it at a deep level, and that's the great, great thing, and that's what I want to continue to teach you, is all of a sudden I could take this meal, and I can still eat broccoli, which I eat every day. Not great, right, for the vata, but what do I do? Well, I put heating spices on it, and all of a sudden now, and I make it heavier by adding oil. Oil is then going to more balance Vata, I'll talk about that in one moment. So that's if you know what works, you can always balance it based on family as well. So though I can't do any hot sauces during the summer, it's very funny because if I do a lot of hot sauces during the summer, when my pitta is really flaring and when my wife's like, you need to calm your pitta down, she literally says that to me because I'll be like amped up. What happens is the hot sauces during the summertime will actually start to give me a little heart burn. And it's very, very interesting because that would never happen during the winter. So it just goes to show you it is also your current state, your vakriti. All right, let's move on. What else is not good for the pitta when you're in a pitta state, but can be good for the kapha sometimes, okay? Is the sour fruits such as pineapple, lemons, grapefruit, tamarind, sour berries like cranberries. All right, also not good for the pitta, alcohol and tobacco. Why? The pitta is also governed by the liver and alcohol greatly affects the liver. Same with, obviously, tobacco. Okay, let's talk about water and earth. These are foods that would not be great for the kapha body type. Milk and dairy products. Milk and dairy products, milk and dairy products, milk and dairy products, not good for the kapha body type. This also goes for kapha children. So bad for their bodies, but I will talk about that another time. All right. Also, plums and watermelons and grapes and cantaloupes and papaya and peaches. A lot of the watery foods when the kapha body type already holds a lot of water. A lot of times in my practice, they say, I always feel like I'm swollen. I feel like I'm puffy. Well, we're, a lot of times what we need to do is add more of the natural diuretic-based fruits and vegetables rather than the juicier fruits such as the watermelon. Okay. Coconut water. Coconut water is super popular, right? Can be good for other types such as the pitta, but not great for the kapha. All right. Cucumbers, although I would make an argument for that for kapha because they can be a natural diuretic. Zucchinis, tomato, and salt. Salt is so great. Himalayan sea salt, rock salt, Celtic salt, 
for the vata, but not great for the pitta because it can increase swelling, increase water. And then earth-based foods, those are water foods, earth-based foods, nuts and seeds, and uh, meat and mushrooms, and a lot of the heavy root vegetables that are great for vata, but obviously not for kapha, right? Opposite foods. Beans are good for the kapha, certain types of grains, coconut meat, and then hard dried fruits. But you have to be careful again with the kapha and fruits as well, especially dried fruits where you can eat so many. And then again, they're an anabolic type, so they're going to accumulate more of the salts and the minerals. So we just have to be a little bit more careful with that. All right, hopefully that was helpful. And now the last part is I want to read you off the list of all the foods so you can start to get a framework. But I do hope my the last part I just read, I believe, is more important to understand the macro. Understand which foods balanced vata and which foods balance kapha and which foods balance pitta as well. And I'll give, of course, this won't be the last time we talk about the diet and foods with Ayurvedic dosha types, but today I want to give you that overview. Okay, best foods for vata. Sweet fruits, apricots, avocado, bananas, berries, cherries, coconut, fresh figs, grapefruit, grapes, lemons, mangoes, melons, oranges, papaya, peaches, pineapples, and plums. Those are the fruits. Now, I have to give you always the caveat because you just can't say, oh, I'm vata, so I'm going to start eating figs. I'm going to start eating grapes and all of these things. Well, here's the deal though. If you're a vata body type and you've run an organic acids test or you've run a stool test or you've run a food sensitivity test or all three, ideally for your gut, and you see you have candida overgrowth, you see you have bacterial overgrowth, and you see you have certain food sensitivities that would prohibit you then from eating grapes and figs for a little while while you're trying to reduce candida and bacterial overgrowth, or you find you had a, you know, a set food sensitivity randomly to peaches, well, you wouldn't eat those, right? Because you do have to understand is that you can't supersede your current state. If you were like me and you took lots of antibiotics and all of a sudden you got candida overgrowth and SIBO and all sorts of issues, IBS, you need to balance that first before you can go back to some of the foods that do best for you. And again, just because it's on a list doesn't mean you're going to digest it well. I don't do well with bananas on an empty stomach. They're a little too high glycemic for me even though I'm more of the vata body type. I do better with a lot of the fiber-based fruits. I do better with the berries and certainly things like cherries, okay? So do understand that, that just because it's on a list doesn't mean it's okay for you. And that's why like, even if we go to an Ayurvedic practitioner, like here are the foods that are best for vata, it, you still have to test it with your unique bioindividuality that always trumps everything. And also, it might trump it in the season, or it might even just be your current state. And six months from now, you can go back to those. There are so many histamine-based foods that I could never do in the past that I can do now and I do okay with. And nightshades, I can do okay with them like once a week, but I can't have them two days or three days in a row. Then it does start to affect me in terms of inflammation. Okay. The no fruits for vata are the dried fruits, apples, cranberries, pears, persimmons, pomegranate, and watermelon. Okay. Vegetables are going to be the yes foods are cooked vegetables for vata. Remember, cooked, easy to digest, warming. Asparagus, beets, carrots, cucumber, garlic, green beans, okra, cooked, onion, cooked, sweet potatoes, radishes, and zucchini. And again, ideally cooked. Not lettuce leaves, not airy foods, nothing like that. I've already explained you know, why that before, because of that lightness, because of that airiness. So that the foods that wouldn't be as good for vata, or at least certainly raw, would be Raw vegetables, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, celery, eggplant, leafy greens, lettuce, mushrooms, onions raw, parsley raw, peas, peppers, white potatoes, spinach, sprouts, and tomatoes. Now, again, if you're going to have any of these, certainly try to cook them or just have them in moderation. Remember, you can balance the vata body type by having it in addition to a meal that is heating and more comforting for the body. So for example... I recommend a smoothie for almost every human alive in the morning. Why? Well, easy to digest breakfast. And, and again, you'll have to go back to my podcast specifically on that for breakfast, the ideal breakfast. And the reason is, well, obviously for detoxification, there's so many reasons I can't go through that today because I'm already over my time limit with you. But you have to understand that there are certain foods uh, that are great for the human body to get in and hydrating. But what do you do? Well, you simply add ginger to heat the smoothie if you want, or you know, during the winter. You blend it up so the smoothie is warmer. Or you don't drink it for 20 minutes like I do, or you eat a warm bowl of oatmeal like I do to pacify vata before I have my smoothie. So there's so many things that you can do. Okay. For grains, best grains for vata are oats cooked, rice, wheat. And again, most people 
shouldn't be eating the hybridized wheat that we have today, but that's a story for another day. The worst grains are barley, buckwheat, corn, millets, dry oats, or rye. The best animal foods are beef, chicken, or turkey, eggs, fried or scrambled. The worst animal foods would be lamb, pork, venison, or rabbit for vata. Best seafood, all seafood for vata. Legumes, only legumes, no beans are great for vata, no chickpeas. The beans that are better are split mung beans, some sprouted organic tofu, or some lentils. And again, those should be sprouted or soaked. All nuts are are okay in small quantities, better soaked or sprouted, or both for vata. Seeds, the same. Sweeteners are okay, except white sugar, which would be too stimulating. Condiments, all spices are good for vata. Dairy products are just okay for vata, just moderation. Again, they're a little heavier to digest. And all oils are very good for vata. But remember, we're not recommending things like cooked canola oil or canola oil in general. We're recommending healthy fats such as avocado and olive oil, etc. All right, pizza foods. Let's go over those quickly. Best fruits are going to be the sweeter fruits such as apples and avocado and coconuts and figs, dark grapes, mangoes and melons and oranges and pears and sweet pineapples and plums and pomegranates and prunes and raisins. The fruits that aren't as great for pizza are apricots and berries and bananas and cherries, cranberries, grapefruit, green grapes, lemons, sour orange, papaya, peaches, sour pineapple, persimmons, or sour plums. Basically, we're looking at the sweeter fruits, not as much the sour fruits, okay? So you can look up sweet fruits, and then you can look up sour fruits, and you'll know which ones are better for pitta. All right, best vegetables for pitta. Pittas, remember, have a very robust digestion, all right? But remember, it means that you have a robust digestion. What if you're a pitta with acid reflux and you've been on acid blockers? Totally different story, right? Or you're a pitta with H. pylori, or you're a pitta with candida overgrowth. You need to fix those first before you get back to your natural state. But they do great with sweet and and bitter vegetables. Asparagus and broccoli and Brussels sprouts, cabbage and cauliflower and cucumber and celery, green beans, lettuce, mushrooms, okra, peas, parsley, green peppers, potatoes, sprouts, and zucchini. A lot of the vegetables that the vata doesn't do well with, right? Because they have the more robust diet digestion. They don't do as well with the beets and the carrots and the eggplant and the garlic and the onions and the hot peppers or spices and the radishes, spinach, and tomatoes. All right. Best grains for them are the cooked oats, the white basmati rice, wheat, not as great with corn, millet, oats, brown rice, or rye. Do well with the white meat, chicken, or turkey, the egg whites, and the rabbit. So less of the saturated fat, less of the heavier meats, oily meats, and not as well. Again, I just said that with egg yolks and pork and a lot of the seafood, okay? Pretty much only shrimp and maybe a small amount of venison would be best. This list is available in Dr. Vazant Lad's book as well that I linked up last week in episode 922. Okay, so they don't do well with nuts in general, except a little bit of coconut. Why? A lot of people don't know this. Coconut is actually cooling, and that's why uh, Pitta does well with coconuts. Sweeteners are okay, except for molasses and honey. The seeds are, are not so great, except for sunflower seeds and pumpkin seeds. That's why pumpkin seeds are really great for most people, except not as much the kapha, but actually a lot of times kapha does great with the two. And the reason is it provides some much needed iron and much needed zinc as well, which all body types need, especially in this Western-based society. Okay, spices aren't great for pitta at all, except for some coriander, cinnamon for blood sugar, cardamom, fennel, turmeric, and a small amount of black pepper, very small amount, or it might cause actually acid in that pitta. Okay, they do okay with some cottage cheese, ghee, certain types of cooling-based milk, coconut, olive oil, sunflower, and some soy. Again, we're not saying good or bad, we're just saying what is. They don't do well with the sour or fermented-based foods, buttermilk, cheeses, sour cream, yogurts, almond, corn, safflower, sorry, or sesame. All right, let's go over those pitta foods so we keep it (laughs) under control with the time today. I know we're a little bit over, but again, once I start get talking on Ayurvedic medicine, we didn't even get into the foods for 20 minutes, so I apologize, but there's so much to teach in, in Ayurvedic medicine. Kapha foods that are better for fruits are apples and apricots and berries and cherries and cranberries and figs that are dried. Uh, Again, but I wouldn't really recommend the figs. They're a little too high glycemic for that kapha body type. 
mangoes and peaches and pears and persimmons and pomegranates and prunes and raisins. Okay. Best foods though, really for the kapha, for fruits really, are the berries and cherries and cranberries. And then the pears are also totally fine. The persimmons is okay. And the pomegranate is great. Okay. Lower glycemic fruits for the kapha body type. Okay. Not so great fruits. They lumped avocado in here, which I'm really considering more of a fat. It is obviously a fruit, but bananas, coconut, figs that are fresh, grapefruit, grapes, lemons, melons, oranges, papaya, pineapples, and plums. I can make an argument though for pineapples, sorry, for grapefruit. And the reason is they can be great actually for blood sugar and uh, balancing parts of the kapha as well. Okay. But again, individual recommendations could be given to you by an Ayurvedic practitioner or just by doing a lot of your own research as well. Vegetables that are great for kapha, asparagus and beets and broccoli and Brussels sprouts and cabbage and carrots and cauliflower and celery and eggplants, garlic, leafy greens, lettuce, mushrooms, okra, onions, parsley, peas, peppers, potatoes, radish, spinach, and sprouts, right? Why sprouts? Because they're light and they're airy and they help to balance the kapha, which is more heavy. And it does not mean overweight. It just means heavy. That's all it means, okay? We have, to, we have to keep this in mind in our Western mindset right away. It's like we've been brainwashed to believe that there's good, there's bad, there's heavy, there's overweight, there's all these different things, but none of it is true. It's what we give meaning to. Okay, the vegetables that are not great, very few. Cucumber, sweet potatoes, and tomatoes, but again, we can, make, we can really make an argument for all of those. Sweet potatoes being lower glycemic, cucumbers being a natural diuretic, tomatoes and zucchini, of course, we don't need uh, for the kapha. All right, best grains, barley and corn and millet and oats and rice in small amounts, rye. The negative grains are going to be more of the heavy foods, heavy oats, rice, or wheat. But the truth is that the kapha body type just does better without grains in general because they're more of an anabolic food and they can be a little bit more higher glycemic. So we just have to go a little lower. In my practice, we use root vegetables as a starch, more of the potatoes as needed, sometimes never at dinner, oftentimes at lunch. But we can talk about that in the future. Kapha body types does better with some of the darker meat, chicken or turkey, eggs not fried, and some rabbit. They don't do as well with the beef, the lamb, the pork, and the seafood. Why? Those are heavier foods uh, that would weigh down, be more anabolic. They do okay with shrimp and venison. Pretty much besides that, though, for a lot of seafood, it's a little too cooling for them and a little bit too wet and damp also as well. Legumes, they do pretty well, except for kidney beans, soybeans, black lentils, and oftentimes mung beans. Although in Ayurveda, Ayurvedic medicine pretty much uses mung beans or split mung beans with everyone. So they have no issue with that at all. And then kapha doesn't do well with a lot of the anabolic nuts. So we don't do a lot of nuts with kapha. But again, you can make an exception for that. Why? They're great at balancing blood sugar. They really are. And they can be used as a afternoon snack as needed if the kapha needs to be getting, if they need to transition more to the three meals per day, but they're not used to that, well, then they could do something like walnuts or even some type of seeds if needed mid-afternoon just to keep them satiated until dinner and then eventually just the three meals per day like I've spoken about in the past, okay? So just tune into my podcast before on how many meals per day should you eat. All spices are good except too much salt for the kapha and Dairy is just not very good for that kapha body type. If it is, it has to be heated, it has to be warmed, but a little bit of ghee might be okay. A little bit of goat milk. Why? Because goat versus cow. Goat is warming and cow is cooling. But again, we can talk about that in the future as well. A lot of oils are not needed with that kapha body type because they're not supposed to be a higher fat, higher protein body type. They're supposed to be, believe it or not, a higher vegetable, which no everyone talks about, right? So we talk about low carb this and that. Really, what we need to be talking about is what type of carbs rather than all carbs bad or all carbs good. So I want to keep it at that for today's podcast because I know that I have spoken quite a bit. What I want to leave you with is this, is that I'm going to talk more about the diet and the body types in the future. What I want to also talk about is that please be careful about the information that you're getting. Just be careful. My information does not mean that it trumps all information. I just gave you about a 45-minute podcast but I cannot give you every intricacy out there. All I want you to do is understand that there is no one diet for every human being alive. And more importantly, the diet that you need right now should be based on your vakriti of your current constitution. And when you get balanced, you will then be actually able to transition 
to a diet that is then better for what's called your natural procreti or genotype. And remember, there is no one best body. We were all born. We were all given an amazing body that just has to stay balanced. And when it's balanced, it will serve us well in life. We will be dis-ease free and we will live that strong, energetic, and vital-based life that we were all destined to live. Take care, everyone. If this show is helpful, as always, please do feel free to share it with anyone else you believe it could serve. Before you go, I wanted to share a personal story with you. The real reason I began to get well finally is because I figured out what was wrong with me. And that might seem pretty obvious, but I went from doctor to doctor for over two years before discovering at-home functional medicine lab testing. These are the labs that enabled me to finally figure out what was wrong with my hormones, blood sugar, electrolytes, and gut health. And once I knew what was wrong, I could then follow a proven plan in order to rebalance my body from the inside out. This is why I believe so strongly in functional medicine lab testing and why I've made it my mission to share these labs with the world. Now at equa.life, you can order an at-home lab test or lab bundle for you and your family and be able to complete it within the week. Plus, the equal life difference is that you're not left to try to read and figure out these labs on your own. We explain what your lab numbers mean, what they mean in the much bigger picture, and then how to go about rebalancing your body in order to heal. To see our full selection of lab tests or to set up a free lab selection call to find out what labs may be best for you, simply head on over to equa.life forward slash labs. And do remember, we ship these all over the world. To find out more and to set up your free lab selection call, simply head on over to equa.life forward slash labs. That's E-Q-U-I dot L-I-F-E forward slash labs. Labs.